years before, uh, came before me, and I think they've laid out a lot of very abstract notions about blockchain. And what I want to do is make it not more concrete, but even more philosophical. And then we're going to get like super specific. So the first thing is, let's kind of rethink what privacy is. And the reasoning for that is if blockchains are the trust machine and we keep on talking about trustless technology, let's try to understand where we are in our world, right? So what is privacy? So you can look at it from an individual side, which is the state of someone being free to do whatever it is they want without anyone else infringing on that or taking note. But then let's look at the <coughs> inverse of that, which is basically say, it's the state of not having everyone know what it is you are. And this is also something that I think uh, bears a lot of uh, a need to kind of rethink what that is, especially in the age of uh, surveillance technology, i.e. Facebook, Amazon, Alexa, who really, really likes to know everything you're doing, and Google. So let's just think, do we want to be private? And what is the cost of divulging information with other people in terms of hey, I don't have anything to hide, and that's why I don't care if everyone knows everything, or maybe I don't have anything to hide, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people need to know. Now, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna share a little anecdote. Um, I've been spending uh, about a couple of days each month in the last six months in Germany, usually Berlin. And it always hits me, and I have to say, it's kind of like my Israeli hot temper. Why the hell do you not accept credit cards? Why is, what is this love of cash? I, like, I don't understand. The only place I ever have cash is in Germany, literally. And on the cab over here, um, I kind of knew and I had the years to pay for the cab, and uh, I, 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 I the cab driver, no credit card, right? And he says, no, government doesn't need to know. I go, no, 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 they won't know. And he says, yes, but do you want a receipt? I said, well, yes, of course I want a receipt. But then I, I, it occurs to me, has no problem giving me a receipt, which goes back to the tax authority, so they know exactly what kind of revenue they have. But he's scared that if he takes my card, they, there's a communication between the credit card in the cab back to my credit card, gets an authorization. Everything comes back, everything, everything, the government will know. So that little dichotomy, I think, also translates into blockchain, right? And we're talking about trustless. So I do what I always do, ask the experts of what does the Webster Dictionary say? Well. Trust is a system of feeling very certain about something. I'm very certain that if I use the credit card, everyone will know. Hmm. And uh, two, it's the trust that the system and all the operation and the different intermediaries will not fail. There will be no point of failure. Um, trustworthy systems, on the other hand, is a system that is not only is trusted, but warrants that trust. Because the system's behavior can be validated in a very convincing way through formal analysis by a third party, right? And when you really think about Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a single ledger technology. It means that I can send money to anyone else and that transaction won't happen unless that person can validate that I really have a Bitcoin to send to whoever or whatever public address that is. Now, how do they validate that? Well, there is a single ledger and everyone can look at that single ledger. Hence the term uh, consensus that we always uh, use, say, and the double spend problem. I can't be sending my Bitcoins both to Anya and to the gentleman in the back at the same time because, hey, that would be credit and that would be bad. I can only send what I have and every one of them can simultaneously check that I have enough Bitcoins to send to either. How can they do that? They look at the blockchain, i.e. the single ledger, the public ledger that everyone else can see. Now. What are these unique features? That means that anyone can look into the ledger, right? Because I can send my money to anyone. There's no need for a credit card uh, company to call them up and the cab driver doesn't have to be very, very worried. It's decentralized, as in there are a lot of repli replicates of this ledger in every single node, and it's immutable, meaning it's gonna live on that blockchain forever and ever and ever. That is immorality. No one else can reverse a transaction, no one can else can change it. What does that mean? So a lot of people, a lot smarter than me, have probably stood on this stage all day and told you about blockchain, it's gonna change the world, it's gonna make the oceans rise, uh, the poor are gonna be no longer with us. Um, I don't know. Um, people are gonna walk on water. At the end of the day, all blockchain is, it is, is a distributed database. 
you need evergreen one that is on this blockchain holds a copy of that database. That database we call the ledger or the blockchain. Now, we need this in order to have consensus, so we know that I'm not sending bitcoins that I don't really have to Anya and then she'll be really, really, really pissed at me, right? Um, and that didn't come up. So, now it's on. You heard me, right? Yeah. Okay, we're good. So, the consensus in Bitcoin is who am I sending, to whom am I sending, how much am I sending? And this is what we mean when we say trustless. It means that there is a trust that within the Bitcoin system, whoever, whichever transaction is valid, that means that someone, who we know their address, but we don't really know who it is, has the Bitcoin, which we know how much, to send to someone else, who we don't really know what they, who they are, we just know that they have a very, very long public address. However, let's go back to the start. Remember when I told you that it's immutable? No, that was bad. Remember when I told you it's immutable? That means that once I send that transaction, it's going to live on that blockchain forever and ever and ever. Hence, this is a place where that cab driver right in this afternoon had to actually be really, really scared. Only everyone tells you the blockchain is anonymous. Bitcoin is anonymous. No one really knows who these people are. No, it's pseudonymous, right? So the ledger has public addresses. It doesn't say Maya and this is her address. It's, there's a string of about 26 characters and that is really what the address is. And everyone can look at it because everyone has a copy of that ledger, i.e. the blockchain. Now, you can do a lot of very interesting linkages and analysis and look at them and at the end of the day, there is no privacy. And uh, there's this thing called DAC, which is uh, direct acrylic graphs that can be put on this. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of like burst your little bubble when they say that Bitcoin is really, really good for criminals and money laundering and all those things. Because you knew, you know what? The pseudonymy basically means that the Bitcoin is not only not anonymous or private, it means that it is traceable down to the exact person when you do a lot of transactions. And just to give you a point, I don't know how much history you heard about, but there was a really, really big hack in Mount Gox in 2014 in Japan. And last week, this week, yeah, today's Friday, right. Sunday, uh, Monday, I had a, the pleasure of being on a panel with Jen McCaleb, who is the founder of Ripple and, C and Stellar, and he was the one who coded Mt. Gox. Um, and uh, just so you see, if you look at the Bitcoin ledger and you do what I, uh, the direct acrylic graph research, you could actually link all the different addresses that came in from Mt. Gox and say, this is a Mt. Gox account. You can take a look and look at uh, uh, Satoshi Dice. Satoshi Dice, if you don't know, was, was a, one of the stupidest internet gambling sites ever that was very popular in 2013-2014 and all the, the, the addresses where they would send the winnings can be linked just by looking at the blockchain. Now, there are two very interesting companies that not only kind of render the point of saying Bitcoin is good for criminals, something pointless and stupid, but they actually work with law enforcement. Elliptic and Chainalysis, Johnny Levin. And uh, I have a story here that I, I found that how they helped Europol um, find different people that are using money Bitcoin for money laundering, but there's a much more interesting story about this guy who was doing uh, a drug deal and got on a flight from uh, New York to Atlanta. And by the time he landed, uh, some police officer in Atlanta took him out and said, give us your, your computer, checked it out. They couldn't open it. But what they knew is that the, he had just transferred Bitcoin and they knew that he was getting on a flight to Atlanta. And because of the Bitcoin, they could pinpoint that he was the kingpin in that deal. This happened about two months ago, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong. And the company that worked with the FBI and the SEC to check it was Chainalysis, Johnny Levitt. They're based out in, in New York. He's a longtime Bitcoiner. So let's go back to blockchains and kind of remember what they really are. They're transparency machines. And everything that we say that they're trust machines, the trust is dependent. But literally, this is the biggest dependency that we can consensus this thing happen on the fact that the ledger, the blockchain, is transparent and public for everyone to see. So now you're thinking to me, wait, Maya was supposed to be talking about privacy. How does this kind of ring in and make sense? Well, Privacy is a problem, and there have been a lot of attempts, especially in the last three years, how does privacy go along with blockchain and Bitcoin and all these implementations. But now I'm going to talk about something much, much more familiar with you, four little letters that are making every person in business rethink what they do in their tech. 
GDPR. For those of you not familiar with that, that's the uh, general um, direct privacy regulation of the EU, which basically says that no EU information or data about a person can leave the jurisdiction of the EU. Now, imagine a blockchain, <coughs> a global blockchain. Transactions happen between Hamburg to Dallas, back to London, which, okay, London is iffy. We don't know if they're you. But <laughs> back to Paris. Now the question is, is it valid with the GDPR? Because hey, we didn't really send information. All we did was we had a gibberish public address into a gibberish public address back in Dallas and then sent the expenses back to Paris. So there are a lot of questions. What, and, and I think kind of GDPR is a really good framework to try and think about information, privacy, and consensus. What information are we sending it? Where is it residing? Who are we depending on? And where do they reside to validate this transaction? And what is really being sent in the information about the transaction? So again, apologies. I know you had a very abstract day and I'm being meta on meta over meta. But you have to actually think about these things in order to look. So remember I told you about Satoshi Dice? We're going to go back in Bitcoin history. And we're going to talk about the first privacy solution that came up. And this were, were coin mixers, this is back in 2013. Coin mixers are basically, uh, we're gonna send our Bitcoin, not to someone, say that guy, we're gonna send it to a person whose services is to mix all our coins together so we can obfuscate and we won't really know where they're sending it to. Now this is uh, based on uh, ring signature cryptography and just to give you an example, both Alice and Bob are sending money to a coin, to a coin mixer, who is called Minus One, and then that coin mixer sends it to Romulus. We all know that money came from Alice and Bob and ended up with Romulus. But do we know if Romulus got the money from Alice or from Bob? Right? So we're kind of obfuscating who is sending to who, but we all know how much Bitcoin is being sent in this uh, transaction. And uh, then came a Monero, which is a public blockchain, not Bitcoin, it's a fork, that comes in and, and basically built upon uh, much more advanced regular signatures as I described before. I'm trying not to get too techy, so if anyone wants to go further deep into this, like, I'm available for a, a big geek out later. So, the first uh, implementation of Monero is to use the, the ring signatures in order to obfuscate, once again, by different transactions and little mixers that never actually made it to the blockchain from the sender to the receiver. However, everyone knew what the amount was in the first iteration of Monero. So, then there were more. Uh, a bunch of new other coins. Starcoin is very, very famous, mostly for a guy called Amir Ta'aki. Anyone hear that name? Okay, cool. So, Amir Ta'aki was, uh, um, it's a very interesting character there, just a story out about him. Um, he's a, a, a genius hacker. He was uh, very early on into crypto, and he came up also with a different uh, ring signature implementation for dark coin in order to keep the anonymity of any, uh, any blockchain coins. Uh, Amir Taki is famous for suddenly disappearing off the face of the planet where everyone in the Bitcoin community was convinced he had joined ISIS. Well, think again, he didn't. He joined the other side. Uh, he spent a couple of years in Syria, and he very recently moved back into Europe. He's based out of Barcelona right now. And uh, that's just an anecdotal nice story, and he's a very, really, really interesting uh, person to follow. Um, Dash and Bitcoin were, were also implementations like this. But, Sorry, some of the setups and the, and the, um, and the, the, okay. In the meantime, we're going back ahead, we're about in 2015, 2016. Bitcoin became more than Bitcoin because we had other implementations of public blockchains and the banks and the finance people and the real hardcore geeks got really, really interested in what they call private blockchain implementations, right? Private blockchains are basically, let's use the distributive ledger where everyone agrees on everyone for enterprise use cases. And then they started experimenting. And after a while, they kind of asked, well, you know what? We just realized it's a transparency machine. And that means that our competitors or co-competitors can see the information of what we actually transact. So they started thinking of other implementations where they don't really put information on the blockchain. So what they do is they put hashes, hash commits, what we call it. Now, the best way that I have to explain hash commits is a blender. And the reason I, I use this metaphor, because A, 
I think it's the easiest way to, to explain a lot of mishmash of what, what it actually is in hash and B, just so you understand how pointless it is, and that's my personal opinion. Um, what they do is, if in the past, what we wanted the distributed ledger or the private blockchain to, to do is for us to share information, me to send to uh, this gentleman information. Now, I'm going to send it to you via email or Slack or Telegram or whatever it is that we're using. But in order for you to know that there was a consensus and we all agreed that I sent you that information, but I don't want you to know the information that I'm actually agreeing to send you, we're not going to put it on a blockchain. What we're going to do is we're going to put a hash commit. And what a hash commit is, imagine a file, some have you putting it in a blender and getting a string of gibberish. Now we publish that string of gibberish on the blockchain. So if at any given point in time, the lady who just walked in, asked, did you really send that, that exact file to someone because we have a dispute somewhere along it in the future? Now, I can say, oh yes, I did, here's the file. Can you check that this is really what you said? Well, if I were to put it back in the blender, I would get that exact hash. So um, this is why, this is really, okay. Right. Um, this, is the, this is the problem when you work with Apple and then you try to export it into PowerPoints, you always find very, very interesting surprises. I have a PDF file as well, if you can that out. Cool. Um, so this is why I usually tend to say that hashes and blockchains make the blockchain from a, a trust machine into a notary time stamping machine. And I, use, and I usually call it, I'm looking, looking at you because I know you're gonna, you're gonna give me some bad uh, tip for this. I call it block trees. It's not really a blockchain, it's just a notarizing machine. There is no trust, there is no consensus, it's not really interesting. But a lot of advisors get a paid a real bunch of money, right? So it sounds really, really interesting, but it only gets something implementable. Is this the, P the PDF? Perfect, real. Thank you. Yeah, and then we go to the video. Cool. Yeah. Totally, there was a block to reason it. Um, so then we went back to the crypto. Because we realized two things, that the cryptography on the public blockchain uh, is not good enough for us to actually have privacy. On the other hand, there is no real private solution for private blockchain. And in the meantime, some research uh, in what is called homomorphic encryption became a lot more applicable. Now, homomorphic encryption, and this is a very, very layman's definition, is how do I prove to you that I did a computation on information that I'm not showing to you and sharing you the result, right? If I, how do I show you that I'm running a function on X and getting the result Y without giving you any of the information, but I just want to prove to you that I actually computed on the information that I told you. Now, the way I explain it, and this is an awful explanation, but I worked really, really hard to tell you this little story. There's a psychopath running around the streets of Hamburg. I don't know if you've heard. Now, um, it's a very particular kind of psychopath, right? He has this very specific fetish of going into children's bookstores and heading straight to the shelf of Where's Wally. Do you know Where's Wally? Yeah. So he likes to pick up that book and he replaces the pictures in the book with the same exact identical <laughs> pictures, only one difference. There's no Wally. Oh my God. <laughs> So the kids come in, right, and they pick up the book and they want to look for Wally. And uh, after 10 minutes, a bit of frustration, 15 minutes, full tantrum. 20 minutes later, these are trust issues for life. Now, suppose in another, in another uh, couple of days, the kid walks back into the, the, the bookstore. He heads to the clerk and he says, listen, can I pick up the Where's Wally book, but does it really have a Wally in the book? Now here's the question. How does the bookstore owner prove to the kid that there's a Wally in the picture without telling him anything about the location of Wally? Anyone? The answer to this is gonna be super, super simple, and it's one of those things that you think, well, why are we talking about encryption and digital? What you really end up doing is you just take a piece of paper that's twice the length and twice the height, and you cut out a picture, like a, a very, very small slither, that has, you know, well, at least half, right? Red, white, always the same, the same shape. And then the bookstore owner slips it on top of the Where's Wally and puts it 
just so that you can see that there's a Wally in the picture, but you don't know if it's over here, over there, over there. All you know is that somewhere, with him putting the picture underneath, he proved to you that there's a Wally. Um, so I, what I wanted to do, so this, this kind of uh, uh, computation is called zero knowledge proofs. And these, this is a uh, very advanced crypto that was uh, basically invented in the early 80s. These people, the two people who came up with it, one of them is called Shafi Goldwasser, the other one is called Mikali Nukolo, and they won the Turing Prize, which is the Nobel for Computer Science. The only problem was with, with this technology is that it wasn't very applicable because of the hard, uh, the very difficult computation. How do you do this? It's very uh, computational heavy. And so came up, we came up with other kinds of technology that can do this, but differently. Um, I just want to introduce it to you and say a very few uh, words on it, and then we can move on to uh, some more interesting things. SGS is a secure enclave that Intel came up with, uh, where they say, hey, you don't need a, a third party to do this computation. You can disclose it. But we have this hardware that's super <laughs> secret, and we can share both the information and the computation, and put it aside, and we'll publish the result to both sides of that transaction, right? Small thing, Intel will have the back door. But, you know, trust Intel. Intel Spectre happened. Spectre is this huge uh, hack that turns out that there's a, um, a malware within a lot of invulnerabilities within Intel hardware. You guys do never heard of that. Basically, I think it render it void, but uh, there's still a lot of people within the blockchain space that are playing with this in different implementations. I think they're going to be playing with it for a while, and then they're going to realize that this is not an interesting solution. Uh, R3, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, blockchain consortia, um, has been pressing this solution, despite the fact that they know it's not a good solution. The other one is Zero Knowledge Snarks, VK Snarks. Uh, they're called Snarks because of uh, several uh, features that they have. One, the completeness. If I am proving, think about the bookstore owner, if I am proving to you that I am, in order for me to prove to you to, that I'm telling the truth, you have to verify that I am telling you the, the, uh, the truth. The second thing is the soundness. I can provide you enough information for you to see that the, the proof, um, for you to convince that the, that the verification in itself is sound. Uh, and the third thing is your knowledge thing, meaning I don't need to disclose any additional information for you to, to verify that the result of the computation is true. Uh, the subsequent part is that the volume of what we need in terms of information and the computation is uh, comparatively small. The non-interactive part of your FCK SMARTS is the more interesting part because it basically says that no third party is needed in order to uh, interact or change. You can trust that this entire computation that was done is completely trustless. Um, the first implementation application after, after almost 30 years of CK SNARKs was uh, a public blockchain called Zcash. Now, remember the beginning when I uh, told you about Monero, I told you that you can hide who is sending to who, but you don't know how much. So what Zcash did was they were able to do a very, very small, they took a fork of Bitcoin and they did a very small BKP. And when I say very, very small, this is one of the biggest breakthroughs that happened in applicable cryptography. <laughs> and in order for them to show how sound and how no one touched with it, they have this thing called trusted setup, or the ceremony. Um, and uh, in order for it to set up uh, um, a blockchain or nodes that have the proving keys and the verification keys for these uh, um, snarks or uh, ZK snarks, they did this a uh, very elaborate Gonzo style setup. <coughs> every single person, every node that got the proving keys and the verification keys and the snarks was sent to a different place at the end of the world and wanted to show that they're setting this up and no one can hack them and no one can interact with them. And so one guy went out, rented a car, went to uh, a Walmart, bought two computers, took one computer out, destroyed the modem, went up to the Canadian uh, Rockies, uh, made sure there's no cell, then there's no cell coverage, left everything there, then went to another uh, Walmart, bought another cell phone for a modem, um, and so and so and so forth. You can look at uh, Trusted Setup and uh, Google Ceremonies in Zcash. They're very elaborate. The, the latest ceremony that they had involved going to Chernobyl, 
bouncing off a, a helicopter, making sure that the radioactive material is not going to interfere with the soundness of what I described to you early, earlier. Um, it's good PR, and it, it sounds like fun. Um, so Zcash, what they do is they take the transparent layer of who is sending to who, and they run another ZKP between the inputs and the outputs that they have in Bitcoin in order to hide how many coins are actually sent, and then anyone else can verify that there were these uh, points to send to the other side. Um, and the assets in themselves are shielded and not made public. Uh, what do we have right now? They basically have three kinds of transactions. Some of them are public, some of them are private. Uh, the fully shielded ones are when they don't know who sent to who and how much. Uh, the really, really funny part of it, it's actually only 10% of the transaction. All the rest are public just like Bitcoins. Um, meaning transparent. You can send from one address to the other. There's a bunch that's about, I don't know if these numbers are correct. I think this, is, this has been updated. I think this is more than about 15. That they're obfuscating one of the characteristics of the transaction. Uh, so we talked about Monero and Zcash. And uh, just so you understand um, how they're working and how, how many degrees of privacy they have. But remember how we started the whole conversation, we were talking about trust and trustless and what it is we're validating and what is the consensus that we're agreeing upon. Um, what ZKPs or zero knowledge proofs can introduce to you is the concept of the consensus on content. So that blockchains are not only distributed ledgers or uh, distributed databases, but they're also a conduit to get a consensus where third party people can agree to have uh, the answer to a question on someone else's private data without knowing the private data and without publishing any of, of the other information on that blockchain. And that is a real uh, breakthrough, if you will. And you can see that, oh, sorry. That's a really big break breakthrough. Um, and I just want to give you a bunch of examples. These are our three examples. Um, I'll give you my own examples. I think uh, I've been pl we've been playing around with this idea for uh, a longer time. I can prove to you that I have an answer to Sudoku question is usually the example of what people give in order to explain CKPs. I like Waldo. Um, I can prove to you that I'm an adult without telling you that I'm an adult or how old, when I was born. I can prove ownership, the binary, do I own real estate, do I not? I can prove uh, the, uh, the valuation of an asset without disclosing what the asset is, how much do I hold, and what the market price of that is. Um, you can also prove compliance of information without disclosing what it is you're complying or what the information and to whom um, you've disclosed that to. So, remember how we talked about the block trees? Now, if we put the Ethereum blockchain and ZK snarks, we get Socrates. Um, and this is a relatively new development that has only very, um, in recent months, been implemented. It was uh, first featured in the Ethereum DevCon in uh, November. Yeah, November, right? Um, so, the Zerbatis basically allows certain binary information to be obfuscated. If you want to have if you want to have a more elaborate conversation as to how they interact with smart contracts and different distributed computation, we can do that offline. Uh, but basically the concept is that now you can prove to a third party what happened off-chain and the fact that there was a, a, a true computation without disclosing uh, the inputs to that. Um, 